Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Elhamdülillah ve salatu ve selamu ala Resulillah ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve men ve ala amma ba'd Welcome everyone, Elhamdülillah I believe this is our uh, our fifth our fifth session or six I could be mistaken on the timing but Alhamdulillah we are uh, dedicating Friday nights if you're in the Western Hemisphere if you're in other parts of the world Saturday morning to uh, different aspects that can help improve our relationship with the Quran um, and the focus um, is more oriented towards um, contemplation and reflection on the Quran along with other tangentially related topics so tonight's session inshallah uh, will be dedicated to the virtues of uh, reflecting on the Quran tadabbur al-Quran so uh, although tadabbur is its what is tadabbur is its own topic and inshallah if Allah gives us the opportunity I would like to dedicate next Friday's t- um session to that but uh, tonight I'm reading from a book by the name of Halu uh, Salafi Ma'al Quran the relationship or the uh, the condition of the pious predecessors with the Quran written by a contemporary scholar uh, Dr. Badr Ibn Nasr Al Badr um, so in this session uh, or in this chapter related to Tadabbur Quran he says that Allah Azza wa Jal tells us in Surah Sa'd Surah 38 verse 29 that Allah says himself that this book was sent down to you, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by the agent of Jibreel Alayhi Salaam and it is full of blessings so that people may in one recitation لِيَدَّبَّرُوا ayati, so that they may contemplate and reflect on its verses or Allah directly says لِيَدَّبَّرُوا ayati in another recitation so that you may all reflect and contemplate on its verses and signs وَلِيَتَذَكَّرَ أُولُوا الْأَلْبَابِ and so that those of intelligence may reflect and ponder uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he also says that أَفَلَمْ يَدَّبَّرُوا الْقَوْلَ أَمْ جَاءَهُمْ مَا لَمْ يَأْتِ آبَاءَهُمُ الْأَوَّلِينَ that this is a kind of a tangent it's not related to the direct topic but when I was reading the tafsir of Imam Ibn Jarir rahimahullah is a verse in Surah Mu'minun Surah 23 verse number 68 that Allah says addressing the mushrikun of Quraysh in Arabia that would they not reflect on the speech meaning the Quran or has something come to them that which did not reach their ancestors and forefathers so uh, this is a subject that I feel some of us could relate to more where when it comes to worldly accolades like many of us may be first generation college graduates or students and although no one in our ancestry may have achieved this but we still want to you know make our family proud so similarly in our deen um, a person should have an ambition uh, for one their own individual relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, but two it is not an excuse not to have come from a heritage that may be rich in scholarship or rich in knowledge um, because uh, a person is not the byproduct of their ancestors because we all have to individually answer for our deeds. So basically this ayah, according to Ibn Jarir, was saying 
that you know just because the Quran did not come to their forefathers the Arabs didn't pay attention and reflect on it and and realize its significance so that just made me think like when it comes to the things of this world I mean many people find it easier to uh, become the first college graduate or the first degree holder or graduate student PhD holder um, and they feel like this is a sense of honor and dignity for our families which is, alhamdulillah is a blessing not to say it's negative but when it comes to the knowledge of the deen a lot of people tend to make excuses and say oh you know my parents maybe or my grandparents or great grandparents were not you know uh, people of knowledge and whatnot. So anyhow, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He sent this Quran for it to be reflected upon and for it to be contemplated upon. Um, as we dedicated, uh, I believe, three sessions ago to the dangers of reading the Quran without reflecting on them. Alhamdulillah, we don't keep the clubhouse replay but there are video recorders available on the YouTube link above or the channel so anyhow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he would never oppress and never wrong his slaves uh, by sending them a book that they could not engage with or they could not interact with that they could not access um, that yes there are maratib there are levels of accessing the Quran um, but from those levels the first according to Abdullah ibn Abbas and some say Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is that the whole human race along a person has you know uh, you can say uh, mental faculties their ability to function and do not have you know a mental disability or illness um, there's verses in the Quran that everybody can engage with it doesn't take a lot of you know proficiency of the Arabic language or other Islamic sciences to engage with such as uh, Allah says Allah Allah say Allah he is the one um, so any person can engage with that verse he does not need or she does not need uh, a you know scholarly background to engage with that verse. The next level, it requires some act, uh, some familiarity, and proficiency in the Arabic language. Uh, because learning the Arabic sciences improves one's uh, familiarity uh, and um, accessibility of the Quran. The third one, it requires scholarship. It requires scholarship. As Allah says, uh, Allah says, according to the recitation of Allah ibn Abbas Allah basically says in the beginning of Surah Ali Imran he is the one who sent down the book to you of Muhammad meaning the Quran from it are ayat who are muhkam muhkam are known to those verses that have one clear meaning and other verses they have some ambiguity to them or they could have multiple meanings. So as for those who have the disease in their heart of deviation, then they will try and find the ambiguity of it. Uh, and Allah says their intention is to do this, ibtigha al-fitna, for, uh, for tribulation and, um, and to cause... Uh, deviation uh, and also they try to seek its interpretation then Allah he responded he said 
that none knows the tr interpretation of some of these verses which are ambiguous except Allah and those who are firmly grounded in religion. So Ibn Abbas, he continued in his recitation and did not stop. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he would stop and say, only Allah knows their interpretation. And then the Rasikhun, those who are firmly grounded in knowledge, they make this dua and supplication. They say, وَالرَّاسِقُونَ فِي عِلْمِ يَقُولُونَ آمَنَّا بِهِ كُلُّمْ مِنْ عِنْدِ رَبِّنَا As for those who are from the ground in knowledge, they say we believe in it, it is all from our Lord. وَمَا يَذَّكَرُوا إِلَّا أُولُ الْأَلْبَابِ And only those of sound intellect will reflect. So anyhow, the third level of engaging with the Qur'an, certain ayat, it requires scholarship. And the last level, only Allah knows. Allah, as a challenge, He started the Qur'an where our knowledge ends. Alif Lam Mim. That nobody knows what is the derived, implied meaning of these huruf al muqattaat which begin, I believe, 28 chapters of the Qur'an or more, uh, with individual letters. So Allah right after saying those letters without anyone knowing, not even Prophet Muhammad وسلم, not Jibreel, knowing what was the implied meaning of them. But right away Allah He said that kitabu la that this is the book, in it there is no doubt. It is guidance for the pious. So usually in the Quran, although this is a different topic, whenever these individual letters are mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right away he mentions something related to the Qur'an. Uh, Surah Ali Imran, Alif Lam Mim, Allahu la ilaha illahu al-hayyu al-qayyum. Uh, uh, Allahu la ilaha illahu al-hayyu al-qayyum. Uh, Nazzara alayka kitabu bil-haqqi. Musaddiqa lima bayna yadayhi. So anyway, after these individual letters, Allah will say some unique aspect of the Qur'an. So anyhow, now we see that Allah commanded us to reflect on His book. And now, inshallah, we will look at the benefits of contemplating and reflecting on the verses of the Noble Qur'an. So I'll try my best to translate without having to read the original text uh, because from my experience, many audiences tend to zone out when they hear, you know, a lot of Arabic and a little bit of English. So I'll do my best, inshallah. But we're just covering certain uh, sections of the chapter. It's not the entire chapter in the book. So the Prophet ﷺ told us before he left this world, he told the Ummah, تَرَكْتُ فِيكُمْ مَا إِن تَمَسَكْتُمْ بِهِ لَن تَضِلُّوا Kitab Allah wa Sunnati. He said that I have left behind for you two things that as long as you hold fast to them, you will never go astray. The Quran and my Sunnah. And this is reported by Al Hakim and Al Tabrani. So then the author he says, when a person leads a life of the people of the Quran through recitation and memorization and contemplation and reflection and action and steadfastness no one will truly recognize this life except the one who tastes its sweetness and lives it and finds the benefits in their own life uh, pers you know, first hand and what can help someone or one of the best things that can help someone attain this kind of life is to reflect on the verses of the Quran and to contemplate upon them and to glance in them so that it will help them on acting upon the Qur'an and following it by fulfilling its commandments and staying away from its prohibitions. And then the, the author, he quotes a statement of Imam Ibn al-Qayyim al-Jawziyah rahimahullah or Ibn al-Qayyim al-Jawziyah that uh, he explains the importance of reflecting on the Qur'an and he says as for the reflection on the Qur'an then it is what increases the you can say sharpness of one's vision of their heart and to understanding the meanings of the Qur'an 
and to collect one's thoughts regarding reflecting upon the Quran and understanding it. And then he says this is from one the objective, the main objective of res of the revelation of the Quran and it being sent down. Not just for reading only without understanding or reflection. And then he quotes the verse that we started with. Kitab Azanahu Ilaika Mubarakun liyadabaru ayati this is a book you have sent down to you, O Muhammad that is full of blessings so that people may reflect or so that you may all reflect on its verses and signs and miracles and so that the people of intelligence may reflect so then the author he says there is nothing more beneficial for the slave in his life and also in the hereafter and some, there is nothing closer to saving him from the hellfire than the reflection on the Qur'an and contemplating on it for long hours and collecting one's thoughts upon its meanings and verses because this is what uh, shows the believer all the avenues of good and also the avenues of evil and the paths and the causes that can lead them to either good or evil and its objectives and its fruits and you can say byproducts um, and all of the dangers that can mislead them um, and they can they, through contemplating on the Quran they can access the keys of success uh, and beneficial knowledge and they can uh, they can firmly uh, establish or they can firmly harness the principles of faith in their heart and the uh, and purify their intentions and they also may, it will show them the true picture and reality of the this worldly life and also the hereafter, or life after death. Um, and it also explains to us Jannah, heaven and the hellfire. Uh, and they may attain these, uh, um, they may attain these beliefs firmly in their heart. And they also show us the Quran through contemplating shows us the um, the the stories of the previous nations and generations as to how Allah gave victory to those who stayed firm on the truth and He destroyed those who went astray. And contemplation on the Quran also um, it it exemplifies or it shows us plenty of examples of um, taking lesson from those before us it shows us the justice of Allah and his bounty it shows us the greatness of his essence and his beautiful names and perfect attributes and his actions and all that he loves and that which he detests and in essence, this Qur'an, it is a path that leads us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sorry, uh, it was a very long paragraph and it is short in words but very rich in meaning. Um, may Allah forgive me for my shortcomings by not doing justice in translating. But anyhow, continuing in the same chapter... The author, may Allah preserve him, he mentions that uh, the, the pious predecessors before us, they knew the importance of reflecting on the Quran and its verses. And it was one of the main reasons that they were able to take positive effect from the Quran. By fulfilling its commandments and establishing its laws and limits and practicing upon the Sharia. And they made it nourishment for their souls and uh, 
uh, sustenance for their hearts and the, the, the coolness of their eyes and the purification of their souls and that is in combination it rectified their affairs so they became successful in the worldly life and in the life after death and then he quotes some of their statements such as Abdullah ibn Mas'ud where he mentions that uh, the Quran I don't know how is a better way to explain this metaphor um, because by just worldly tr word for word translation the dictionary I don't think does justice to it but uh, he explained that the Quran should not be read very quickly too quickly nor should it be so slow like as if you are not fulfilling the rules of Tajweed because uh, the Quran has a special uh, it has special uh, honor that it should be shown and respect that it shouldn't be read like regular speech but also it should not be beautified so that it is to the level of what they say tilhin like singing um, but then he says uh, that you should stop and pause at the wondrous amazements of the Quran or amazing wonders of the Quran and use it to shake in your heart like bring life to your heart and this is a very important statement he says after that 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 don't let one of your desire, your goal or your con your worry when you read the Quran to be I just have to finish the surah. Um, this was not something that was common in the earth generations. Well, uh, but their goal was to take ibrah and lesson and reflection from the Quran. It wasn't just, you know, I finished this surah or I finished that surah. And then Abdullah ibn Umar, he says, كُنَّا صَدْرَ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ وَكَانَ الرَّجُولُ مِنْ خِيَارِ أَصْحَابِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ مَا مَعَهُ إِلَّا سُورَةً مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ أَوْ شِبْهَ ذَلِكَ وَكَانَ الْقُرْآنُ ثَقِيلًا عَلَيْهِمْ وَرُزِقُ الْعَمَلَ بِهِ وَإِنَّ آخِرَ هَذِهِ الأمة وَإِنَّ آخِرَ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ يُخَفِّفُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْقُرْآنِ حَتَّى يَقْرَأُهُ الصَّبِيُّ وَالْأَعْجَمِ فَلَا يَعْمَلُونَ بِهِ He says that in the early stages of this Ummah, he was a companion of the Prophet Wasallam. So he saw the, the Qur'an be revealed, he saw revelation before his own eyes, رضي الله عنه, or he witnessed it. Uh, he said that there used to be... A man from the best of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, but he had only memorized just one surah from the Quran or something like it. And the Quran was very, uh, for lack of a better translation, it was very heavy on them, meaning they took it with great reverence. And because of that, they were given the ability to act upon it. And then in the end of the generations, he's saying, and when the companions speak of you know, the future, or the, you know, something they would not witness in life then, it must have come to them through the Prophet ﷺ because the companions, they were the most trustworthy of this ummah to transmit our religion for us. So there is no way our religion would reach us with authenticity if they did not have trustworthiness. And for them to speak of the unseen without knowledge, this is... Un untrustworthiness and it would be impossible he said it will come in the end of this ummah or the Quran will be in the end of this ummah very light on the people until a young child or a non-Arab will recite it and they will not act upon it and Allah knows the best uh, what he meant by a non-Arab an ajam but uh, perhaps what the meaning would be is because if a person does not know Arabic, they can still read the Qur'an. Many of the Ummah, if not majority of the Ummah, 80% of the Ummah are non-Arab. And there's no blame on them for reading the Qur'an. But 
they would not reflect on its meaning. Because the Umar who defined an Arab to be someone who spoke Arabic. It wasn't genetically inherited through biology, but the essence of being an Arab was to speak the language. So he says that at the end of the times or end of this Ummah, the, the Quran will become very light on the people and a young child or non-Arab will recite it and not act upon it. In another statement he said that we lived in a t time uh, f uh, long, long ago or we lived for a long time and one of us would be given Iman before the Quran. So a surah would be revealed on Prophet Muhammad and they would learn its lawful and its prohibition, its uh, you know unlawful and its commands and its negations. And it was not befitting for any of us uh, f to leave off this. ثم لقد رأيت رجالا يؤتى أحدهم القرآن قبل إيمان. then Abdullah ibn Umar imagine this is just you know one generation after the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم or or two that he said now I have seen people who have been given the Quran before Iman so they may recite from Fatiha until the end of the Quran and they will not know what its commands are nor its prohibitions. Or they would not know where they are supposed to stop and, and, and how they are supposed to act upon it. And then uh, the, he mentions a statement of Al Hassan al Basri, he says, uh, who was the generation after the Prophet. <laughs> he was telling those generations that were with him, he was saying that. Indeed, the people before you, referring to the companions, that um, that they saw the Quran as a message from their Lord. They saw the Quran as a message from their Lord. So they used to refakan wa tadabbarunaha bil-layl wa tafaqadunaha bil-nahar. They used to contemplate on its meaning by the day. Excuse me. They used to contemplate on its meaning at night. And they used to inspect it during the day. So he proceeded the night before the day. And this is perhaps why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Muzammil, that when Allah encouraged Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to wake up and pray the tahajjud prayer when he was in the early stages in Mecca um, that uh, before the five daily salah were made obligatory on the ummah that the sahaba and the prophet would pray tahajjud for over one year every night so Allah said that indeed standing up at the night it is better for uh, and praying and reciting the Quran it is better for developing discipline and it is better f or easier to help you understand its meaning so there is a special virtue in reciting the Quran in the late part of the night but then they would still inspect its meaning during the day then the author, he says, may Allah preserve him, that indeed reciting the Qur'an with reflection and contemplation and inspection, it is medicine for the heart and it rectifies one's inner state and outward state. And upon, according to this, a person can attain benefit from the Qur'an. And then one of the pious persons is Ibrahim al-Khawas. He narrates from Ibrahim al nakhi who was one of the great uh, fuqaha that established the Kufan madhab of fiqh that led to the madhab of Abu Hanifa rahimahullah and this is very important if anybody I encourage myself as well that if we are in a state where our hearts are so uh, either 
um, distant from Allah or very hard and it is very difficult to do good deeds and stay away from sin that this is like you know when we have a fitness goal like we want to get to this weight or this performance level then we have to change certain diet habits and change also our workout so this is a five step workout plan that's been proven generation by generation for the medicine of the heart it says the medicine of the heart is five things. Number one, to recite the Quran with contemplation. Number two, to keep one's stomach empty. That if you notice when you do worship and you are very hungry or very, uh, very light, like you you haven't had food in a while your heart is able to savor the sweetness of ibadah more. I mean, this is very common in Ramadan, like when people go to Tarawih, they just ate like, you know, a fur and dinner and all these things, iftar, so it's difficult for them to enjoy Tarawih. Uh, so similarly, when the stomach is, is empty, you took some time, like similarly, like even in fitness, and if a person wants to, you know, burn fat or, or burn, you know, more calories that will lead to them losing weight or building muscle, then they usually go to the gym at least maybe two hours, maybe an hour and a half minimum without having any food in their system. So, you know, ibadah is similar. Doing worship of Allah is similar. That when a person has an empty stomach, they will feel its effects more. Number three is Waqiyamul Layli uh, is to stand at night, as we mentioned in Surah Muzamma, to pray the Tahajjud prayer. Number four, Wattadarru in the Sahar. And another form of worship that is special at night is uh, towards the last third, you know, closer to the entrance of dawn and fajr is to humble oneself before Allah. وَبِالْأَسْحَارِ هُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ Allah explains His pious, the qualities of the pious servants who enter Jannah and the people of Taqwa that in the time of Sahar, the last third of the night, which is how we get the name Suhoor and Sahur, the eating of the food and the act of eating the food before the fast begins, to humble oneself before Allah, seek forgiveness at that time. And number five, and to sit with the pious people. This brings life to the hearts. So a quick recap. Number one, to read the Quran with reflection. Number two, empty, keeping a stomach that's empty. Number three, to stand at night and pray to Hajjud. Number four, to humble oneself and seek forgiveness from Allah in the last third of the night. Number five, to sit with the pious and then Maliki bin Dinar rahimahullah he used to say that ma zara'a al-Qur'an fi qulubikum ya ahl al-Qur'an that all oh, people of the Qur'an what did the Qur'an grow in your hearts it's a metaphor but Allah knows best if this is a his understanding of the dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam where the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to pray Allahumma inni abduk wa ibn abdik wa ibn amatik na usiyati biyadik na adhan fiya hukumuk adhan fiya qadauk as'aluka bi kulli ismin huwa laka sammayta bihi nafsak aw anzaltahu fi kitabik aw allamtahu ahadan min khalqik aw istatharta bihi fi ilm al-ghaybi indak anta ja'ala al-Qur'an al-Azim rabi'a qalb So long dua he prays Allah and he showed his humility Inshallah, maybe we can dedicate one of our future sessions to du'as related to the Qur'an or du'as that will help transform our relationship with the Qur'an from the Sunnah. That he used to pray that, Oh Allah, I ask you about all your beautiful names and attributes, that you make the Qur'an like the spring rain for my heart. So similarly, when we see, now we are still in winter in the, in the nor our northern hemisphere, um, and you know spring is close by once everything you know the leaves fall off in fall and then in winter 
you know it's so cold and then the spring comes the rain comes in the spring and the earth becomes alive again so the prophet ﷺ made that dua oh allah make the quran the spring rain springtime rain from my heart so the quran is what gives life to the heart so malik medina was saying what has the quran grown in your heart and then he says in al quran rabi'ul mu'min indeed the quran is the spring of the believer كما أن الغيث ربيع الأرض just as the rain is the spring or means of life for the earth and then he we're almost done inshallah um, he mentions as an incident of Hassan al-Basri um, and he says that إن هذا القرآن قرأه عبيد وصبيان لا علم لهم بتأويله he said this Quran was revealed by some, you know, uneducated people, slaves, and children. They did not know its interpretation. And they did not fulfill its the command where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka mubarakun ayati. This is a blessed book that Allah sent. To you, O Muhammad, so that people may reflect on its verses. And this kind of goes to what was covered last week about the Quran is either a proof for you or against you. And uh, he's saying that the true contemplation upon the Quran is only achieved through following it and acting upon it. أما والله ما هو بحفظ حروفه وإضاعة حدوده. They said that I swear by Allah it would not come from just memorizing the letters of the Quran and uh, and transgressing its laws and limits. حتى إن أحدهم لا يقول. And then this is a very important statement that shows us what does it truly mean. To be a hafiz of Quran, and he says, he says some people will claim قد قرأت القرآن كله فما أسقط منه حرفا. He said I have read the whole Quran, and I didn't leave off one letter. هل حرف كم تجين? Then he said, وقد والله أسقطه كله. He said that this person thinks they they didn't leave off one letter. He said they left off the whole Quran, and he says why? والله ما هؤلاء بالقراء ولا العلماء ولا الحكماء ولا الورعاء. So these people, they are not reciters and qadis. They are not scholars. They are not wise people or pious people. And then there is another narration at the end of the chapter, but he says, he told the person, والله أسقطه كله لأنك لم تعمل به. He said that you have left the whole Quran because you don't. Practice by it. You don't practice by it. And then he says, the author, uh, may Allah preserve him, um, that uh, another statement of Imam Ibn Qayyim, that, فتبارك الذي جعل كلامه حياة للقلوب وشفاء لما في الصدور. He says, Blessed is Allah, the one who made his speech a life for the hearts and cure for the che- what is in the chest and uh, bre- uh, you know breast of people. وبالجملة فلا شيء أنفع للقلب من قراءة القرآن بالتدبر والتفكر. And then he says, There is nothing that is more beneficial to the hearts. From reciting the Quran with contemplation and reflection, فإنه جامع لجميع منازل السائرين. Because the Quran, you know, sometimes people when they want to, you know, seek tasqiya and piety, they look at the books of this scholar or, you know, that friend of Allah or pious person, which is not something bad, but we forget that the 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 original source foundational source for spirituality is the Quran itself because it directly came from Allah and no one can teach us how to reach Allah better than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself 
Allah. So then the author he says, "Follow علم الناس ما في القرآن ما في قراءة القرآن بالتدبر لشتغل بها عن كل ما سواها." If the people knew the what were the benefits of reflecting upon the Quran while reciting it, they would have become busy with that in, instead of anything else. فإذا قرأ بتفكر حتى إذا مر بآية وهو محتاج إليها في شفاء قلبه كررها ولو مئة مرة ولو ليلة ولو ليلة. He said that if a person recited a verse with contemplation and reflection and he sees that it is a means of cure for his heart he could repeat it even a hundred times or even a whole night and that would not be enough فَقِرَاءَةُ آيَةٍ بِتَفَكُرُ وَتَفَاهُمْ خَيْرٌ مِنْ قِرَاءَةِ خَتْمَةٍ بِغَيْرِ تَدَبُرٍ وَتَفَهُمْ and then going back to the the importance of reflecting on the Quran you know sometimes we think okay I have like an hour 30 minutes I'm just gonna do tilawa and read and read but what I heard from you know scholars that even if you use that same amount of time one hour 30 minutes 20 minutes and instead of just reading different ayahs and surahs you just look at one page or you look at a few ayat or you look at one verse and you just keep thinking and you just analyze what is the subject of this verse, uh, what are the points being made, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala miraculously chose every word in the Quran. There is nothing in the Quran that is random. Everything in the Quran, it has a specific purpose that Allah selected this letter, Allah selected the order for a reason, Allah repeated things or didn't repeat things for a reason. Everything has purpose. But then, what is the reward of that? He says that if a person just reads one ayah with contemplation and understanding, it's better than reading the whole Quran without understanding and contemplation. And that contemplation of one ayah is more beneficial to his heart and uh, help him reach him or her iman and the sweetness of the Quran than reading the whole Quran without understanding. And then he says, this is the adha, the custom of the Salaf, the previous pious predecessors, previous generations. يُرَدِّدُ أَحَدُهُمُ الْآيَةَ إِلَى الصَّبَحِ One of them would repeat one verse until the morning. They would spend the night in prayer until Fajr would repeat one verse. And our own Prophet wasallam, in the hadith that is reported, I believe in Sahih Muslim, that he would read this verse in Surah Ma'idah in تُعَذِّبُهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ عِبَادُهُ وَإِن تَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ فَإِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ That if you forgive them, O oh Allah, or sorry, if you punish them, O oh Allah, then they are your slaves. And if you forgive them, then you are the mighty, the Almighty, the, the Most Wise. And this is the sta- statement of Isa السلام, in Surah Ma'idah, but the Prophet, peace be upon him, he kept reading this ayah over and over and over again the whole night until Allah revealed to him through Jibril that, O Prophet Muhammad, we are going to please you regarding your ummah on the day of judgment and we will not displease you. So then the author, he says, reciting the Quran with contemplation, it is the the essence of the rectif- rectification of the heart and then uh, the, another example of how the companions understood this one of the tabi'un named Abi Jamrah he told Abdullah ibn Abbas that inni sari'u al-qira'ah he says I read the Quran very fast inni aqra'u al-Quran fi thalath I finish the Quran every three days or three nights فَخَالَصَ عَبْدَ بْنَ عَبَّاسِ هِيَ سَدْ لِأَنْ أَقْرَأَ الصُّورَةَ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ فِي لَيْلَةٍ فَأَتَدَبَّرَهَا أَوْ فَأَتَ 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 فَأَتَدَبَّرُهَا وَأُرَتِلُهَا أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِنْ أَنْ أَقْرَأَ الْقُرْآنَ كَمَا تَقْرَأُ عَبْدَ بْنَ عَبَّاسِ was trying to show him something better. We may think, mashallah, this person reads the Quran 
uh, every three nights is something great, which it is, alhamdulillah. Many of the, the pious predecessors did that. But if it is done without contemplation, then it it is not something uh, praiseworthy. It is not something that should be seen as an objective. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said, for me to read one surah of the Qur'an in one night, and I contemplate on its meaning, and I r- repeat the verses, and I recite them with tartil, you know, slowly, thoughtfully, it is more beloved to me than to read the whole Qur'an as you read it. So anyway, this concludes the lecture portion. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to uh, uh, follow the best of speech and act with it. But anyhow, um, now is the time for discussion. Um, I have to improve my moderator skills because um, our our chair of a woman here is is uh, preoccupied at the moment. But as for a discussion is that I always wanted to know if other people feel this way. You know, like if you stop and you take time to contemplate on the Quran and verses and surahs and you try and find gems and meanings and understanding in it. Why is it that we don't see the reward of this just as much as it is for reading, you know, hundreds of verses or pages in that same amount of time. So anyone wants to volunteer to be part of the discussion, you can raise your hand, inshallah you can join.